Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thanks, as always, for joining us for what should be a really fun show. This week on Toe to Toe, Mike and I will list the top PBC fighter in each of the original eight divisions. Plus, your Dennis Ugas will stop by a little later in the show. But let's get right to our first guest. He's the former unified 154-pound world champion, ready to make his ring return this spring, and we can't wait for it. Swift, Jarrett Hurd. Jared, first of all, how are you and your family doing? Uh, I mean, well, everybody's doing good. You know, we, uh, you know, unfortunately, we leave. We lost our father. Uh, almost like two two years now, and uh, you know, everyone's doing good. Um, we just been, you know, taking it a day at a time, and uh, you know, my brothers, they. They moved back with moms for now, you know, uh, it was just her and pops in the house. So they moved back with her, you know, to, uh, to, to, to be with her. And then, you know, um, we just take it one day at a time, man. And, and I see, I mean, you've been keeping busy. I thought I heard you post that you opened up uh, three businesses during your time away. Is that accurate? Oh, yes, 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 man. We opened up a trucking company, HRS Industries, and we opened up a home care facility, which should be running pretty soon sometime this year, um, Ray and Jay stay. And, uh, yes, we opened up a, a, dog, a dog kennel, so um, French, French oh. cheese kennel, mm-hmm. man. So we've been rocking. But, it's not, but uh, from what we hear, you're going to jump right back into boxing uh, 100% though, right? Yes, for sure, man. You know, uh, the thing is, it, it, it's, it's, it's like I wanted to – during this time of my grief, and I actually also wanted to get all the distractions out of the way, and I wanted to, uh, from far as the business adventures, uh, I wanted to, to travel, do the things I always want to go to, man. I wanted to Dubai and, and, and Greece, two places I always wanted to visit. Um, uh, what else, man? I wanted to do some things with my family, my mother and uh, uh, brothers and um, things like that. So we just, I just, I just basically got recently recently engaged too. I wanted to start a family, man. There's a lot of things that I wanted to do to make sure when I come back this time, it's no distractions. It's strictly focused on boss. Sounds really smart. So, so you've been through a lot the past couple of years. You just mentioned the passing of your father. Uh, how much did that affect you in terms of wanting to actually box? And did you lose, did, you know, that desire to fight after that? Of course, man. Uh, so, I was actually on the fence of whether or not if I was going to come back because my father had such a big impact, you know, like uh, in any room he walks in. I can't, I can't think of a certain person, but like, a, I don't know, uh, just, just imagine the guy that his energy is there. They're expecting him to be there. You know, he's the type of guy that made the whole nights when he's there and for someone with such a big impact in our family and, and in places when he, when he was there, you know, when I lost him, he had such a big impact on boxing. When anyone comes in the house, he was the the one guy who, if you didn't have any interest in anything, he will somehow make you interested because he won't leave you alone to start talking about it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, uh, like even with boxing, like when, when people come over, he was one of the guys that, mention everything about Boston. The Charlo, this is some my boy right here, Lauer, who be Lauer. These guys don't know who these guys are, but he gets them so interested into the sport and then they start following and he picks up fans for me everywhere he go. He's always talking about us. Uh me and my nieces, because you know they they're also movie stars as well. So he always talking, talking, bragging about us. And now not to have that anymore, hear that, you know, I, I was in a part of where I didn't even discuss boxing amongst anyone I was around me. Well, no one's really, mm. I didn't hear anything about boxing after my father passed away. It kind of went straight into the business side of things and it kind of fell back on if I actually want to do this or pursue, you know, 
the the uh, this becoming this big businessman. And um, one time I was upstairs in my game room, and my friend Emmanuel, he was like, uh, he said, "Man, Jared, man, we sitting up here on this couch. If your father was here, he'd be cursing us out right now." <laughs> and I laughed about mm-hmm. it and everything. But as I laughed, I really couldn't stop thinking about the things he would be saying to me right now if I was sitting here not running, not doing anything, because he called me every day about it. And then from that day forward, I started to get up and do little things with my friends. I said, man, y'all want to go run that day? Or y'all want to do this? I got a gym in my basement. Let's work out in my basement. And I would hear him say the things he would say. Like, uh, man, Jerry, the, the boys can't beat you, man. You know, the boys can beat you when you in shape. What's the biggest thing you learned during your time away from the game? Is there anything that jumps out immediately? Um, the biggest thing I learned in my time away, well, I will say if it's anything I learned, it would be financially. Uh, you know, I just had learned the, the ways of managing my money, um, taxes, is taxes, um, um, making yourself into a business as corporate and things like that. I just learned on the business side of things more than the actual sport and managing my money, if anything. But, I mean, away from the game, I was just a fan, man. I was just tuning in every time, watching the fights in my house. You know, I just got a movie theater in my house. So I sit down here at fight parties and was just becoming a fan of it. Uh, other than that, I mean, not too much to learn when you're not in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it sounds like the time away did you some good and, and kind of brought that desire back too. Oh yeah, for sure. Because I think it was when another time where uh, it kind of got me up the train is when, when, when Jamel child became came undisputed because I, I was once a unified champion and, you know, uh, him winning the belts for Tony Harris and someone I previously beat and then seeing him win against Fran Castano, I was like, man, I was, that was around the corner for me. So, you know, it was just like a, a thing that I wanted to finish that I was something that I started, you know? Yeah. Now we, we heard rumors that you were going to return in, in January. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, man. So I was, uh, actually was supposed to return in January and Javante Davis car, uh, was in my hometown. It would have been a perfect, perfect comeback for me, you know, back and back in my hometown. So, what ended up happening is this, I had a situation I was sparring and I got hit directly into my eye. Like it wasn't like a a, a super big punch, but it, it, it hit me directly in the eye and it, it gave me a uh what's this called? Uh it wasn't a scratch on my cornea, it was like a raging on my cornea. And like uh, that Saturday when the press conference was on a Monday. Somebody, and I would have had to come into the press conference with an eye patch on all the time. I said, oh, nah, nah, nah. So we're going to pull out this one. And I couldn't get the sparring at all and all that. So we just we just pulled out of that one. And hopefully we'll be back, be back soon. The eye patch could be a good look, though. That could be your new look. <laughs> yeah, man. Look. Give me the tough guy look. <laughs> so do you, know, do you know when you might be back in the ring? Uh, we're hopefully shooting. I was, I'm, I'm, I was ready for January, so if we don't get anything in February, hopefully beginning of March. We're not exactly sure. I don't have a exact date. Like I said, we're just staying prepared. We don't want to peak at all either, because try to prepare for something that we don't know where it is. But we just, we just, I is open to stand in shape. Are you gonna be uh, campaigning at 160 going forward? No, no. So I, I, I moved up to 160. Uh, if I ever go back down to 154. Which I doubt. You know, my body is different. I, I don't know if I can make the weight tomorrow. It's already tremendously big for the weight class, so yeah. I don't think I would be able to go back down to 154. So right now, I think I'm staying 160. Like you, you, you just mentioned, you were such a big, physically strong guy at 54. Do you think you'll be able to carry that to to the higher weights? Oh, for sure, for sure. You know. uh, I was all to me. Everyone looked at me as a 160 pound anyway, so I think I was filling that weight class pretty well, man. You know, uh, I'll fit right in with them guys. Now, I, you had an incredible run at 54, but you know the big fight, you versus Jamal Charlo, it didn't materialize. If you had a chance to do it over, is there anything you would do differently? You know about your run? 
<laughs> well, I wouldn't say differently. It is why because, like, I, I I'm not the type of person to make excuses. You know, I don't I don't make excuses. They was just a better guy that night, but fuck, I'm gonna make me some excuses today. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. The fight with 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 J- Julia Williams, oh, man. I can say this, that, and the other, but my team was in a one page. Everybody saw the separation I was having with my trainer, Ernesto. Me and Ernesto are on good terms now, but, you know, it was just a whole bunch going inside our camp. And doing the training camp, it wasn't like preparation before and other fights. And it showed that night. And, you know, leaving, going into the, the Louise Arias fight, you know, man, that was a tragic. I, I, I give more credit to. Julie Williams that I'll ever get Louis Sarris, man, because it was raining that night. It was almost something like a sparring session. I trained with a guy who teaches me to box. I couldn't even use move around the ring to use my legs. At that time, I was forced to get into their firefight because the, the ring was so slippery. It was just chaos, man. So both of those guys, if they ever want to run it back, we, you know, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all for it. So, but at the end of the day, this whole thing with Charlo. It's like it is what it is. I look at it as things were supposed to happen this way, and it, it, it is what it is. You know, after the the loss to Williams, I think some people said, "Well, you know, now we know what uh, Jarrett's limitations are." Number one, do you think that's fair? And number two, uh, people thinking that or saying that is that extra motivation for you now? No, uh, I'm like this. I I never was the guy that cared what you want to think. And the greatest thing about me, I'm I'm at my best when I'm on the B side. I, I I feel like when I was the underdog coming up from the Austin awesome, fight Olympians like Austin awesome Molina, come being being the first one to stop Austin Trout, uh, uh, getting a knockout win over Tony Harrison, and being the number one guy in the world in Arizona, Manny Lava, I was on the B side of those fights. <clears throat> Slightly maybe not on the Austin Trout one, but at the end of the day. I perform my best when I'm at, I am I am on the B side. So let them think what they want to. Let them not believe in me, man. You know, this will bring, this will bring the best out of me. I don't expect nobody to look at me as a certain way. I don't have the prettiest style. My style isn't the, the tailor made for the ideal boxer. And I like it that way. Let this aqua style that looks so, so easy to beat punish you. <laughs> well, you just you just alluded to it. So you're known for your pressure cooker style, wearing guys down and then putting them away. Uh, but coming up as a prospect, you were like known as a good boxer, a good counter puncher. Uh, what can we expect from you in the future? Is it going to be a combination of both styles, or what do you think? Yeah, man, I don't want to single my style into a certain way because I might have to alter it for my opponent. Um, I'm not at 154 no more. What what came with the pressure style walking fighters down, just wearing them down is I did have a size advantage at that weight class, and I was using my size to get the victory those nights. But I'm at 160 now. These guys are going to be about my size as well. And it may be some guys I have to move around on. I can't sit there and just bang with. And it may be some guys that, you know, they're going to bring the old Swift back out. And I got to do what I got to do. Now, we, we've seen you training with Andrew Council um, in some recent IG posts. Are, are you working uh, with him full time now? Yes. Yeah, so Andrew Council is uh, my new trainer as of now. Um, things with Kate Caroma, you know, me and Kate Caroma is, 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 is still my guy, man. You know, uh, it's just that he was based out of in Vegas and I was here at home and I was more. Like I need, I needed a trainer to be here with me, but I know he has other fighters and he has to travel a lot because he has to attend to other fighters. But I needed a, 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 a trainer that was more focused on me year round, and I needed to. I, I didn't want to be traveling to follow behind a trainer as well. And 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 not to say it's like he wasn't making me a main focus, but it was a lot of traveling. I just didn't like that. I like I like to be at home. My most success I had was when I was at home, and I didn't want to be an out of state, out of town traveling fighter. So, you know, we looked around the area, and you know, Andrew Council is a is a former professional fighter who fought Bernard Hopkins. He had a win over Buddy McGird. Uh, he fought Winky Wright. You know, he has a lot of knowledge, and 
what I like about Andrew Townsend, not saying that K. Karoma doesn't have this too, but all Andrew Townsend is start he started his fighters from the ground up, like uh teaching them how to throw a right hand and how to throw a left hook. So um he has Trayvon Sniper Marshall and you know, he's a, a PBC fighter fighting on the on the come up right now. And I just like that he took his fighters from when they were absolutely nothing and didn't know anything and turned them into what they are today. So I know he knows a lot. Yeah, he's definitely one of the most underrated trainers. Um, uh-huh. in the day. A lot of people don't know about him, but he's an excellent trainer. Did, did, but you hadn't worked with him before in, in some capacity. How did you guys just connect you, just just by, you know, looking around and seeing what was around or? Yeah, yeah, looking around, he was around. Uh, you know, it's not there's not many trainers from the area I could really say on my finger that uh, will have a, the best, let's say, the best fit for my style. Um, you know, Barry Hunter from from Headbang, that's a great trainer. You know, with uh, Lamont Peterson and them guys. But you know, I felt like I wanted to go to a trainer as well that didn't try to alter my style, like like allow me to be. Jerry heard who I am, but just add a little tweaks to it where as if he upgraded my style and not changed it. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I wanted to ask I wanted to ask you one more thing about the Charlos. So there's been a great rivalry between you guys uh, for a long time. Even stuff I think that occurred outside the ring. Can you tell us how the rivalry started and grew? Man, I, listen, I'm going to tell you how to probably start and how we'll continue. I was always going to end. It's going to always be the same thing. Hmm. It's something wrong with the Charlos. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with them, but they just got some type of animosity. And I'm not going to say Charlos because the older one, uh, Jamal Charlo, the one at 160, he's pretty level-headed, man. Every time I see him, it's a clear understanding that you know, what's up? We are in, your brother's in my weight class. We ain't got to be friends, but just keep the disrespect to a certain level. Like, it don't have to be, you know, disrespect to my fiance. It don't have to be me walking up to Derrick James saying anything. Like, it, I don't have to do all that. You know, it could be between me and you and understand that it doesn't have to ever get personal. I don't know you from the outside of boxing. That's what he don't understand. He takes whatever we have to settle the ring and make it personal towards him. And, I mean, it all started just from him being in my weight class. And, of course, we're going to clash here. We fighters. Eh? But I know we we got animosity with each other. But just keep the disrespect to a certain level, man. Like, it's, it's to a point where he's not in my weight class no more. I'm not in his weight class. He, I mean, yeah, he's planning on moving up soon. It was it was at a time where he had to fight Brian Castano. I just lost to Luis Arias. And he, every time he sees me, it's just something. I don't know what it is. I have conversations, and one day he would shake my hand. One day he would say, man, Hurd, I like you, but, but stop, stop, stop fucking with me. I'm like, I know, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I don't know, man. It's, 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 it's really no animosity. It's just something wrong with it. Something wrong with you, man. Now, you, you brought up uh, uh, Jamal, who, who is at 160. Is he someone you would target? Well, for sure. Uh, hey, look, if I can't get the little one, let me get the big one, you know? <laughs> let me get the big one. That's exactly who I want. I want Big Charlo. I want Jenna back and Triple G. If you're still around by the time I get the other ones, let me get Triple G. The goal is still the same. Unify, unification, undisputed, and that's the same goal, man. So, so last question. I think you you you, you kind of alluded to this just now, but but what's your plan for 2023? How many times do you want to fight? You know, who who are you targeting and 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 so forth? Realistically, man, my ideal my ideal year every year from now on. Because now that I'm back, I don't say no. I plan on sticking around for a while, at least four to five more years. So, my ideal year year every year, I would say. Three fights a year. Do I know how uh, that could happen? Who knows? But three fights a year, and I mean, you know, it'd have been a perfect start by already getting one out of the way in January. That would have gave me a a head start of, of get accomplishing that. But uh, we're gonna see, man. My idea was three fights a year. I'm back. I don't feel, I don't feel like I retire within another three to 
for at least max and minimal three years. And yeah, man, I, 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 you saw my coming up. I don't, I don't, the two enough fights, yeah, it's cool and all that, but you know what I want to do. I want to go for the, for the champions, man. I want to, I want to make the big fights. And I see that they're happening now. All the, all the building of the fighters ain't happening as much right now. And everyone's making a big fight. So it should be hard to make. And let's get it done, man. Swim Jared Hurd is back. We can't wait, man. Jared, thank you so much for taking the time out to, to speak to us. We're so, so glad to see you back in the mix. Can't wait to see you back in the ring. And of course, once we get that, that, that fight, that date announced, we look forward to having you back on again, man. Most definitely. I appreciate you guys. Appreciate Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Jared. Yeah. No problem. It's time for Mike and I to go toe to toe. This week, we're listing the best PBC fighters in the original eight divisions. We'll start from the heavyweight division on down. So, Mike, let's kick this off. Okay, real quick, I wanted to preface this by just explaining it, to make it clear exactly what it is. So I, I actually created what I call grade eight for Boxing Junkie uh, because once upon a time, there was there were eight weight classes. It was heavyweight, uh, light heavyweight, middleweight, welterweight. Uh, lightweight, featherweight, bantamweight, and flyweight, and that was it. So basically, uh, what we do with grade A, what we're going to do here is we combine heavyweight with cruiserweight. I'm just going to go down really quick, so again, so it's clear. Light heavyweight with with super middleweight, middleweight with junior middleweight, a welterweight with junior welterweight, and obviously that's also super lightweight. I, th I think the listeners get that. Uh, lightweight with junior lightweight, uh, featherweight with junior featherweight, bantamweight with junior bantamweight, and then the final category is uh, flyweight, junior flyweight, and strawweight. So that's that's how this thing is set up. All right. Well, let's let's start with the heavyweights then, man. What you okay. Got? Well, the he heavyweight was one of the was one of the easiest ones that uh, that we came up with, and that's Deontay Wilder. Uh, it's oh, a yeah. no it's a no brainer. You know, only one heavyweight has gotten the better of Wilder, and I think you can argue that only two should be ranked higher than him right now, Fury and, and Oleksandr Usyk, because of Usyk's victories over Joshua. Uh, Wilder is arguably the biggest puncher in history. Now, he's a better boxer than he's given credit for, in my opinion. You have to set up those big bombs, after all. Uh, and he proved against Fury that he is the heart of a lion. Uh, and he's absolutely not finished. He proved that by delivering another one-punch stoppage against Hellenius in his most recent fight. So uh, this guy is, is really good. He's just so much fun to watch. Yeah, he really, truly is. I, you know, looking forward to seeing what he does in, in this stage of his career. We just saw what he did with his second camp with uh, trainer Malik Scott. And, uh, you know, the, the sky's still a limit. Even at, at 36 years old, he's still, you know, blessed with great athleticism, speed, and, of course, as you mentioned, the uh, power. Who would you have for number two? I think the number two now, you have to say, is uh, is Frank Sanchez. I think I think that Frank Ch Sanchez has got to be uh, you got to consider him among the two or three best you know pure boxers among among heavyweights. So I think he's I think he's right there. I think this guy could be a future title holder. I'm gonna disagree with you there. I'm going with Louis, uh, not Luis Ortiz, with Andy Ruiz. I think is the uh, the second best PBC heavyweight uh, uh, currently. But hey, look, you know what? Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about Wilder versus Ruiz. Frank Sanchez versus Ruiz is a pretty good fight too. Um, that would settle it, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. I don't know who who we, we'd have for that one. Let's go to um, our second division, which is uh, what is that? Light, light heavyweight, super middleweight. Who you got? Uh, okay, so this one was harder, but um, well, I landed on uh, David Benavides, uh, mm. who's a super middleweight. So I and what basically what I'm saying is that he's the best among all light. Uh, PBC light heavyweights and super middleweights. Uh, of course, this is going to be settled in the ring when Benavides fights Caleb Plant, who is my number two, which I'll reveal right now. Uh, for now, I think Benavides is the man. He's unbeaten. He's a two-time, already a two-time world title holder. Uh, he's just rolled over one opponent after another. You know, his biggest advantage, I think most people would agree over his rivals, is probably his size and strength. But he's a really good, quick-handed boxer. You know, that allows him to land those hard punishing combinations that invariably break down and then stop his opponents. You know, he stopped almost everybody's face. Uh, I think he can push Canelo Alvarez, you know, but of course uh, he could have his hands full against Plant. You know, he's got to beat Plant first before he could look, uh, you know, look beyond that. So, uh, yeah, so Benavides is this guy also one of my favorite fighters. He's really fun to watch. Yeah, and I think you know that with those two, I mean, I think he's definitely going to have his hands uh, full with with Kayla Plant. That's a 50-50 fight to me. And I think in terms of ranking, I I agree with you. I, I guess Benavidez, uh, 
I put him slightly above Plantis because he's already won a world title two times and he currently holds an interim belt. But again, this is going to be a, a fight that's settled in the ring. I'm here for it. I mean, I, I, I cannot wait. I don't know what's going to happen, especially with uh, Plant and his new trainer, uh, Stephen Bridman Edwards. But uh, I guarantee it's going to be explosive and, and uh, press conferences are going to be as good as most fights we'll see. Um this year let's move on to the next category which is the 160 154 pound divisions who do we got this was also pretty easy uh jermel charlo uh which again you know he's a uh, junior middleweight champion which means he's the best uh, at either 160 or 154 uh what more can we say about jermel he's a complete dominating fighter which is why he's on pound for pound list now uh he's had two slip-offs a close decision against tony harrison and a draw with brian castaño uh but he brutally stopped both guys in rematches which is what great fighters do uh as i've said you don't want to fight this guy a second time it's not going to go well uh i really believe he's one of the best in the business he probably doesn't get quite enough credit um also yeah, and I think this was definitely one of our easier choices um, here. But what about number two? I still think Jamal is uh, is right there. I still yeah. think he's a really, really good fighter. Um, he hasn't been active. Um, I think that he's gonna when he gets active again. I think he's gonna show why he's my my number two. Still a really good fighter. I think he actually might be a a, a better pure boxer than Jamal. You have to rate Jamal higher. He's got a better resume and he's uh, he's got uh, more power. Uh, but Jamal's really, really good boxer. Uh, yeah. Can't be overlooked. Absolutely. I mean, we're looking at the uh, middle divisions, Klitschko brothers. You know um, how these guys are moving. Let's go to the uh, welterweight divisions, 147 and 140. Who is the number one guy? So this was as easy as anyone, but uh, Errol Spence Jr. Mm -hmm. um, you know, easy choice based on both the eye test and his accomplishments, uh, which you can't say for everybody. Uh, Spence is just a super efficient all-around fighting machine, maybe as good as anybody in the sport, pound for pound. You actually, uh, I think that we we were talking about this off the podcast, maybe on the podcast. Um, you compared him to Bivol, who I who we both have tremendous re respect for. Just guys, really good boxers, really smart boxers who just know how to get it done and do it every time they step into the ring. Uh, the guy, Spence, is just a brilliant boxer. He's got heavy hands, and he's just as tough as they come. Uh, as he proved, I thought, maybe most notably against uh, Sean Porter. Uh, that's a lethal combination, which is why he's been able to beat one elite opponent after another these past few years. He's not super flashy, you know, in or out of the ring. He's just really, really good. One of the best of his era. Yeah, absolutely. And, and can just do it all. You know, you want an inside fight? I can do that. You want to box from the outside? I can do that as well. Does everything at a really, really high level. Um, Spence, definitely one of the best fighters. Who do you have for number two? So this this was a little bit tricky. There's I was thinking, you know, about two or three guys, but I, I'm ready to go with Jerron Ennis, Boots Ennis. Uh, yeah, which is interesting because he's not coming off maybe his best performance. He's still like almost shut shut out the, the guy he fought, uh, but he's not coming off his best performance. But I think just in terms of the eye test, it's just for sure he's past that. Uh, and I think all, all the talent in the world's there. I think it's just a matter of him proving it. So I'm comfortable with uh, putting him at number two, although you can argue a couple other guys, Stan Jonas, Thurman, maybe even one or two more guys. Uh, it's just a deep division. Yeah, it really is. And man, I struggle with, with number two here. I truly don't know. I guess I'd say Thurman just because he has that track record, but Ugas is there. Duran Ennis is Ugas there. Too. You know, uh, man, there's just so many fighters, um, you know, in, in, in at 147. And even the 140 pounders, uh, you know, Alberto Pollo, Gary Anton Russell, Subrio Matias. There's so many fighters. It's just really hard. I think we can, let's just stick with Errol Spence at number one. That's yeah. what we do now. Um, yeah, that's for an sure. Obvious choice. So, what do we got for the lightweight divisions, 135 and 130? Okay, I went with uh, Gervonta Davis. Uh, you know, Tank might be the best in the business right now, although I think he has to deliver a few victories over the top lightweights to claim his destiny, if you will. Um, you know, I've asked it before and I'll ask it again what's his weakness? You know, he's super quick slick athlete he's polished really really intelligent boxer including underrated defensive ability uh he's one of the top punchers in the world pound for pound probably among the two three or four uh biggest punchers pound for pound in the world uh and he seems to have a great chin tough guy um you know we asked breadman breadman edwards about a weakness and he said tank could jab more okay you know i could see that <laughs> but, I, but i think we're reaching um when you when you come up with something like that i think he's going to beat ryan garcia which is going to be a 
a real challenge and it's a really entertaining fight, but I think he's going to beat Ryan Garcia and then go from there. So just stay tuned. I think this guy could end up number one pound for pound. Yeah, absolutely. Could be the next face of boxing. You know, who knows? Um, I would obviously love, love to see the Ryan Garcia fight and uh, him against any of the lightweights, top one lightweights really are great fights. Who is your number two on this list? Now I had to give this some thought, uh, but I, I'm ready to roll the dice on Frank Martin. I think that, you know, his victory over uh, uh, Michelle Rivera in, in his last fight was really, really impressive. I think it was like a breakthrough victory. Now, I don't want to put too much emphasis on it because Rivera is still kind of a developing fighter, too. But um, I, I saw what I saw. Martin just looked spectacular. So I just expect really big things for him. So I'm pretty comfortable having him at number two. But there, this is another one. There's a few other guys you can consider. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hector Luis Garcia is is another name. Um, Isak Cruz. Yeah, he's one that popped in his, my head. Is another name. Uh, the winner of Ray Vargas versus Oshaki Foster in a few weeks might be another name. Who knows? I mean, there are a lot of great fighters in that division. But like at 147, we can all agree that uh, Javante Tank Davis is the man. Let's uh, let's go down to the uh, the featherweights. 126. And uh, 122, who's your number one guy? Mr. Stephen Fulton. Um, you know, we're going to learn a lot more about Fulton, assuming that he takes on the monster, Noah uh, Inouye. Uh, if he wins that fight, and I think he's capable of doing so, uh, he takes a huge leap up the pound-for-pound pound list. I mean, he becomes a, like a superstar if he can do that. Uh, that said, as things stand right now, I think he's among the best fighters in the world. He's an excellent athlete, an outstanding, clever boxer, which he's proved over and over again. And while he isn't a huge puncher, he's definitely a warrior, as he proved in his uh, close yeah. victory over Brandon Figueroa. You know, that was a brutal fight uh, that Fulton won as much with guts, his ability, in my opinion. Uh, I love this guy's all-around game, which is why I think he has a real chance to knock off Inouye. Yeah, he's already on my top 10 pound-for-pound pound list. So uh, victory over Inouye, and he has a strong case for number one, um, in my opinion. That would be one hell of a resume, too. Speaking of two, Who's your number two? Okay, I went with with Brandon Figueroa as my as my number two. Just love this guy uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, we just talked about what he did against Fulton. You know, he's one of the best fighters in the world. Um, no matter what happens, you know, when you fight Brandon Figueroa, you're going to go to hell and back. Uh, really, really, really good fighter. I think also, honestly, one of the best in the world. Yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, and based on that performance against Fulton and, hey, that recent knockout of uh Carlos Castro was pretty damn impressive too. I think he gets the number two um, slot here, but but Stephen Fulton, of course, strongly at number one in this category. Let's keep it moving uh, to the bantamweights and the uh, the junior bantamweights. Uh, I went with Fernando Martinez. Uh, Martinez might actually be the best fighter from Argentina, which is saying quite a lot, given that Brian Castaño is, is Argentine, but I think you can make an argument. Uh, why do I say that? You know, he's, he not only outclassed a respected guy in uh, Jiruan on Cajas once, he did it twice. Uh, completely outclassed him both times, in my opinion. Uh, he obviously knows how to box. He wouldn't be here if he didn't know how to box. But a big reason for his success is his will to win. Uh, he just imposed himself on Ancajas. He just never stopped coming. And there was, in the end, there was really nothing that Ancajas could do about it. Uh, I throw this word around a lot, but he really is just a little beast. And I think he's just getting started. Uh, I think this guy's uh, got big things in his future based on what I've seen. Yeah, it was really surprising that he beat Ancajas the first time. Um, I was not expecting that. I thought he was a little more uh, sizzled than steak. Uh, he proved me wrong, but to, and then I was like, well, you know, we got to see that rematch and and what Ancajas uh, can can do the second time around. But what do you know? Martinez did it again. So I agree with you. I mean, clear number one here. How about number two? I went with uh, Emmanuel Rodriguez. You know, he's coming off that impressive victory over Gary Antonio Russell, uh, which I thought was an eye opener. Uh, that was an impressive performance. He's one to watch. Yeah, I agree with you. That was a very, very impressive performance. Look, you know, I think a lot of folks make too much of his loss to uh, Noya anyway, uh, which, which can happen to anybody, quite yeah, frankly. Yeah. It's, it's like losing to Canelo Alvarez yeah. back, you know, he's just... Oh, it is, yeah, it is or Floyd Mayweather. Or Floyd Mayweather, I, Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, quite it is frankly, it is. Yeah. you know, um, it's just one of those things, but I think Rodriguez has shown himself to be a, an elite fighter in his own right. Now, there's only one... Uh, original division left which is the uh 
what do we call those? The straw weights and the uh, the flyweight, fly junior fly, straw, yeah, yeah. little all guy. of those divisions. And I couldn't think of any PBC fighter uh, from that category, so I assume we're leaving that one blank. Yeah, let's 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 leave it blank, and uh, maybe we'll revisit it when uh, when somebody emerges that's worthy of this uh, this list. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you never know. Now let's bring in our next guest, the former welterweight world champion and one of the finest Cuban fighters of this era. Your Dennis Ugas. Okay. Well, your Dennis, first things first, Happy New Year. Did you uh, get a chance to enjoy the holidays? No, bien. Ya se dio bien. La familia, eso, y ya se dio todo bien. Everything went great. I spent it with the family, and thank God everything was awesome. How, how's your son doing? Bien, bien. Mi niño bien, gracias a Dios. Now, I was in Miami. In Miami. Ahora, yo estoy aquí en campamento ya. Y, y este es Miami ahora. Uh, my, my son is doing great. Uh, my, the, my family is actually in Miami right now, and I'm in training camp in Vegas. Oh, okay. Well, we're, we're going to get to that in a second. You know, I wanted to ask you, though, uh, you're such a pillar in your community. You, you use your platform to to speak out on injustices in, in, in Cuba. How important is, is your connection to your people? No, es un orgullo eh, representar mi comunidad, representar la gente mía, representar un mensaje que yo llevo sobre, sobre nuestro país, sobre los, nosotros los cubanos, eh, de libertad, de patria, de vida, de Dios. Eh, es algo bien especial. Es algo bien especial, ser un, un ejemplo para mi comunidad, un orgullo para mi comunidad, algo bien, bien especial. It's something truly special to me, a source of pride to be able to be seen as the pillar of the, of the Cuban community. And my goal is to always represent them uh, with pride and with, and with joy in the pursuit of liberty, happiness, joy, and freedom. Love it. Your Dennis, uh, fight fans are looking forward to seeing you back in the ring. Now, you suffered a broken orbital bone in the Spence fight, which took some time to heal. Are you 100% healed now, physically? Entendí, entendí, entendí. Vete, Martín. Sí, adelante. No, que, 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 sí, tu, sufrí la, la lesión en, en, en la pelea con Spence hace nueve meses, eso ya que se había batido 100% ya, trabajando en campamento, eh, esperando para mi próxima pelea. Uh, absolutely, I'm 100%. The Spence uh, injury happened nine months ago. It's in my rear view mirror. And like I said before, now I'm in my training camp in Vegas, rearing up and, and, and wanting to fight, you know, soon in my next challenge. Well, after the injury, when did you get back to training? When did you first go step back into the gym? Muchos meses, muchos meses. He estado corriendo, incluso cuando veía doble y triple de los ojos, estaba corriendo. A gimnasio ya boxeo, ya comencé, comencé este mes. Pero corriendo, haciendo cosas físicas, hace muchos meses. I only came back to the gym this month. It's been a long journey back. Uh, to feeling whole again, but even, but even when I was having double or triple vision, I was still doing cardio. I was jogging. So uh, as far as uh, as exercising, that has been happening for months now. But the gym, it started. It started out with 2023. Well, you must have really must have really been relieved when your sight got back to normal. Oh, mucho, mucho. Fue un tú pasé muchos meses. Eh, mucho sufrimiento, eh, como sufrimiento en el ojo, viendo las cosas dobles, con mucha presión, dolor. Fue algo, ha sido algo difícil, pero gracias, gracias a Dios, gracias a Dios, hemos podido, hemos podido superar todo eso. Y ahora tengo más hambre que nunca. Ahí no soy un niño con más hambre que nunca. Uh, it, it was an incredible source of relief because I went through so much pain uh, during those months with my eye, the, the pressure that will uh, accumulate on them. And then, like I, like I was saying, like having double and uh, triple vision, but you know, what doesn't kill you makes you, makes you stronger. And now I'm hungrier than ever and ready to come back. 
you you brought up uh that your your in training camp we saw in your uh in your last two fights it's i mean you've experienced such highs and lows uh you beat Manny Pacquiao then you lose to Errol Spence Jr. what was that like for you emotionally no i i go i go special very special uh, i go special uh, tal así yo me puse en una posición increíble los, la mayoría de los peleadores en el deporte sueñan con ese tipo de pelea que, que he tenido yo peleando contra los mejores de mi generación contra algunos de los mejores peleadores de la historia ha sido una, una ha sido algo bien bien grande he trabajado duro de los seis años y, y estoy muy, muy feliz con lo que estoy haciendo dentro y fuera del deporte I'm very happy with what I'm doing In, in boxing for my legacy right now because uh, those two those two fights were truly special. They're the fights that most fighters aim for their whole lives and they may never get them. I got two, so you know that that roller coaster. It was uh, it was a joy to ride it because I I took in every moment of it and I and it was the, the fruit of my labor. The labor that I did since I was six years old, the effort that I put in ever since I was a little kid. So, so how could I not appreciate it? What is the biggest lesson you took from the uh, the Spence fight? Oh, hey, no sé. La verdad, eh, no sé. Así la lección de que se que estaba en mi mente que darle una gran pelea para los fans. Y por eso me fui así a palo contra palo, el bumper contra bumper, como se dice. Eh, pero no, no tengo. Eh, esa noche ganó el mejor, pero si pudiera echar algo para atrás, lo único que echaría para atrás es que no, que no me hubiera lesionado, así como me lesionó en el Fraun S7. Prácticamente la pelea terminó ahí, pero todo. Estoy orgulloso y feliz como, como entrené, como me preparé. Como luché esa noche ahí, lo único que hubiera cambiado es la lección que son cosas de Dios muchas veces y ya. ¿Y lo de cubrebocas? ¿Lo, lo, pero lo del protector oh, bucal. Eh, ahí no nos equivocamos. Bueno, y sí, que siempre hay que, hay que, hay que lanzar un golpe. Eso es un. un eso pa... Bueno, termina, termina esto y ahí te, te explico lo que pasó exactamente. Eh, sí, ah, ok. Eh, so... Basically, I don't have any like a, any punctual regrets as far as you know what happened in that fight. Where like I wouldn't be able to tell you that I take a single specific lesson from it because I wanted to give a, the fans a great show, and I think that we did, and and that's why I I wanted to go blow blow for blow without leaving anything uh, back because if I held if I held something back, that would have been something that I regretted. So. The only thing that that I could say that maybe I regret is the injury in the seventh in the seventh round, but I couldn't control that. That was in the hands of God, and everything happens for a reason. So you know, besides that, I you know I was I was content with being with giving my best effort. Sí, no, eh, ese round lo lo te lo lo te no equivocamos. El árbitro dijo esto. Yo pensé que había un golpe de más. Por eso yo me pagué, pensé que había un golpe de más y Pérez también se equivocó porque se quedó. Eso fue lo que pasó. Eh, el árbitro dijo esto y en el momento como que se echó para atrás como que es, como, y me confundió. Eso fue lo que pasó. Uh, as far as the mouth guard uh, incident went, I, I believe that all three of us made mistakes. The ref made a mistake for saying stop. Stop for what? And then I thought that I had done something wrong, perhaps uh, punched, punched him uh, uh, wrong or did something wrong with the, with the punch I threw. And that's, and that's why I stopped. And then Spence was wrong because he was just, you know, standing there. Uh, so in, in retrospect, looking back at it, I should have thrown a punch. Nothing I can do about that now, but that's what happened. Okay. So, so you've you've been in the ring with both Spence and Terence Crawford. How do you see a fight between those two playing out? No, eh, hay eh, good fight, fifty fifty. Una gran pelea y cincuenta cincuenta. Got it. Okay. 
It would, it needs no translation. Uh, Fi and fit to fit. Got it. So Spence, Spence versus uh, Keith Thurman is another rumored rumored fight. Do you have any feelings on who you think might win that fight? Oh, not good, good fight on me. Gran pelea. Eh, pienso Spence un poco favorito por lo golpe del cuerpo. Pues siento que una gran pelea, pero pienso que Spence lo 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 podía detener por lo golpe al cuerpo. It's that's also going to be a great fight, no doubt about it. But in that case, I think Spence has the edge because he's going to wear Thurman down with the body shots. That's why in Pero, the end I think that he will prevail. Pero si me dice que te diga algo para mí una pelea eh, 50 50, 55 45, 50 50 también. But if but if you ask me for percentages, I would also say perhaps 50 50, 55 45 in favor of Spence. Yeah. Okay. Now you said your goal is to get back to the top, which uh, indicates how confident uh, you are. What path do you want to take? Do you want to do a, a, a tune-up, a comeback fight, and then a title shot? W what do you want to do? No, eh, eh, gracias a Dios, soy uno de los mejores pesos fuertes del mundo. Eh, ahora, como te digo, estoy en campamento, me estoy preparando para mi próxima pelea. Si pues no, eh, me gustaría pelear contra un todo de la división. Mi equipo va, va a tomar la última decisión, pero yo le he dicho que me gustaría pelear con todo, en toda la división. Uh, I told my team that I want to fight a top contender in the division. Uh, I I fully believe that I'm still one of the best welterweights in the world. So why hold back? Let's go after the best. Uh, I I want to fight the best, and that's that's what I'm planning to do. So when do you think we'll see you back in the ring? Uh, I'm ready. Well, uh, I can tell you I'm 100% now. Uh, I really don't know which month I will be coming back in, but if you gave me a choice, I would want to come back in April in the one year anniversary of my, of my injury to show how whole I am once again. Is there, I know you said a top contender, but is there anyone in particular that, that you're targeting? Bueno, eh, eh, no sé, hay buenas buena peleas. Me gusta Enni, me gusta Tuma, me gusta eh, Papelial, Rafa, buena pelea. Me gusta Estanioni, buena pelea. Ahí, Tuma, Enni, Rafa, Estanioni. Eh, hoy ti, pero tan no sé cómo cómo para la pelea cómo se ve. Son me gustaría una pelea una pelea a todos contra un número dentro de los primeros 10 del mundo. Me gustaría. I want a top ten fighter uh, in the world as an opponent. Uh, my four uh, favorites, if you will, will be uh, Thurman, Crawford, Stanionis. Uh, or Ennis, uh, you know, Thurman Crawford, Stanis, Ennis, yeah. Those will be the, the the top four, perhaps, maybe even Ortiz, but I don't know how that will work with the promotions and stuff like that. But in the end, I want to I wanna fight one of those five, ideally, if you if you gave me a choice. Very good. So you're Dennis, you're not old. You're, you're 36 years old, but you're not a kid anymore. This is going to be your 13th year as a professional boxer. Can you believe how quickly the time has gone by? No, la, eh, yo, 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 ahí tengo 30 años de boxeo. Comencé a los seis en Cuba. Aquí tengo 13. Lo, cuando yo, cuando yo vine, vine con muchos sueños. Después los sueños se me apagaron un poco cuando perdí dos veces y tuve dos años y medio fue Y regresé. Nunca pensé que podía hacer lo que estoy haciendo. Eh, pelear contra los mejores de mi generación. Ser un peleador que la gente, que la gente respeta. Estoy muy, muy orgulloso. I may have, I may have 13 years uh, and, and counting as a pro, like you said, but I have been in boxing for the last 30. And I came to the United States chasing a dream. That dream fortunately came true. And while it may have faded for a little bit earlier during the past decade, being away for two and a half years, it came, it came around once again. It came true twice. 
So I am so proud of everything that I have accomplished in making that dream come true. You should be. Uh, you mentioned that you're healthy, which is great. Uh, but how do you feel physically compared to, say, when you were a young rising fighter? Oh, totalmente. Soy otro otro peleador. Soy otro hombre diferente. Yo creo que soy 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 mejor peleador que aquel niño de 23 años. Soy mucho mejor mejor la hora con 36. Y y a, había muchas muchas cosas diferentes, pero no. Yo siempre digo no cambiaría nada. Estoy I can tell you with confidence that 36-year-old Yerodin Sugas is a better fighter, a better boxer than 23-year-old uh, Ugas, who was a kid that didn't know any better. Having said that, I, I will have changed anything that I did for the past decade plus in my career, but I do see the benefit of, of experience right now, and I feel, and I feel even better than, than when I started. You know, you, you've you've had such an incredible journey from from Cuba to your setbacks at 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 140 to becoming the welterweight champion. What more is left for you to accomplish? En en este punto, lo que yo significo para mi comunidad, lo que yo me significo para mis hermanos cubanos, sobre mi mensaje, sobre mi país, elevar mi seguir con el favor de Dios, elevando mi mensaje, eso es lo que más me motiva. Well, not only do I want to fight the best in the in the best in the best platforms, but also I know that those platforms that allow me to fight against the best also have me representing the Cuban community, and that's my main motivation right now. Why do I keep going forward? Because I know that I can give a voice. Uh, to the Cuban people that otherwise I wouldn't have without without this uh, this boxing soap box that I still love so much too. Where like I still I still want to prove myself as a champion. Last question, Ugas. Do you uh, do you ever sit back and and reflect on how far you've come? No, no. Reflexiono siempre. Si siempre estoy ando fajado ahí en las redes porque me dicen, wow, porque tú hablas de boxeo, porque todo lo que pasó. Y es parte de la vida. Siempre reflexiona. Soy una persona que se está reflexionando siempre. Y, pero aún así, como te digo, gracias a Dios, tengo un gran en el deporte. Y yo, con el favor de Dios, creo que tengo eh, grandes peleas en el camino todavía. Uh, yeah, like I've definitely sat and reflected through, through my time with the injury while I healed. But at the same time, I like I still think that I have a lot left to offer uh, in boxing. So there's a lot more chapters left to write. Why why stop here? This is this is on the the epilogue. It may not be the prologue, but I still have I still have plenty of chapters left to write in my in my story. We agree. Your Dennis, thank you very much for taking the time out to speak to us. Uh, we're happy to hear that you're you're doing well. Uh, we can't wait to see you uh, back in the ring, and we, we hope to uh, to talk to you again soon. Go, Willie. Go, Willie. Go, Willie. Song fighting a guy of the best. Yeah. Congrats, <laughs> your Dennis. <laughs> Thank you, your Dennis. Thank you so much. That's going to do it for this week's episode. We want to thank Jared Hurd and your Dennis Ugas, of course, for joining us. And thank you guys for listening, as always. Be sure to check us out next week for more boxing talk, more interviews, right here on the PBC Podcast.